Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for coming to the first ever Tide Talk. Um, I'm George. I'm the founder of Tide. Tide, as you know, is the business banking service which exists solely to save small businesses time and money. And there's a whole load of ways that Tide tries to do that, and I'm not going to bore you uh, with the details on that now, um, and I'm sure uh, you probably know a lot of the information that is all available on our website, tide.co, anyway. Um, but I did want to say uh, immediately how grateful we are to be joined this evening by Greg Marsh. Um, Greg is best known uh, as the founder of One Fine Stay, a phenomenally successful unhotel. Um, it's worth noting, I think, that you know you're successful when not only are you successful in a category, the category of the art hotel, but you actually made up the term as well, which I believe uh, Greg did. Um, we're very privileged to have him join us uh, this evening. Before working at, or creating One Fine Stay, uh, Greg was an investor at Index Ventures, so he's sort of seen both sides of the table in the fundraising arena. Uh, so we're really grateful to have Greg here with us this evening. Warren Buffett says the secret of a happy marriage is to marry someone with low expectations. Uh, I feel by raising yours, George has doubly disappointed you this evening because he's set, you, set me up to fail dramatically. So who is running a startup business other than George? Well, George, George, George we know is running a, an exciting startup company. I just signed up for Tide actually. Um, I'm also an investor, so I have a, 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 a sort of a vested interest. Who else is anyone other entrepreneurs in the room? Oh, lots of entrepreneurs trying to be fantastic. The entrepreneurs in the room, ha who has raised more than? Uh, I will keep going up. Hands up. Who's raised any money at all for their business? Yep, one. Right. Okay. More than ten thousand. More than 100,000, more than a million, more than 10 million? Good, okay. Phew. Okay, I can probably get away with almost anything then. Um, so, um, so, 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 I, so I, used to, I used to invest other people's money uh, in other people's companies for a living. And um, I think the experience I had doing that and then being on the other side of the table and raising cash for one fine stay, which was a well capitalized business, we raised a total of about 100 million into the company prior to its exit. Uh, was fascinating because I sort of all the things you sort of suspected were basically true about the way that VCs operate are true, um, and the other thing I'd say is that um, is that, it <laughs> and this is my sort of the spirit of the first of my top tips, it's that if you, <laughs> in a way, the best advice possible is don't raise money at all. Um, raising money is a massive distraction. It's a huge time sink. It will eat your soul and it will destroy your day. And unfortunately, it's not a one-off event. If you're any good at it, you'll end up committing to uh, a horrible, addictive habit of having to raise more money. And every time you do so, you're effectively expanding the circle of people who you uh, risk disappointing if it doesn't quite work out or, or worse. Um, and let's also remember that the vast majority of startup companies and the vast majority of entrepreneurial endeavors in the UK aren't venture-funded businesses. They're not the sort of businesses that look like the sort of hockey stick growth curves. They're not dramatically reinventing an established category. They're not doing what George is trying to do with Tide very admirably. Um, but that requires not only a lot of money, it also requires a very big amount of ambition and an awfully high level of tolerance for ambiguity and for personal sacrifice and pain. Um, most startup companies, and even some very successful entrepreneurial activities, are just great little businesses. They're services companies. They're selling something that people want, i.e. your time or your skill. Uh, almost every plumber with tools in the back of his transit van is effectively running a small business, and some of those small businesses aren't so small. Um, the average plumber in the UK, I want to say, earns about £65,000 a year, so that's perfectly respectable income, especially if you're not living in central London. And many of those businesses end up employing other people. And so our very nice little companies, sometimes they have a little bit of capital to support them, maybe a bank lends them a bit of cash. Very, very few of those kinds of companies ever come into the sort of sphere of influence of this, and by this I mean the most generic sense, sort of startup land, right? And in sort of the enthralled by the prospects of suddenly getting rich quick. Um, uh, and you know, as you famously say, right, get big or go home, because that's ultimately the deal you do with the devil if you raise money from professional investors. So 
I think one thing I often say to people who are thinking about starting a company is don't be fooled by the plethora of business books in the airport bookshelves uh, telling you, you know, this is how Mark Zuckerberg done it. Because very few businesses are even remotely relevant to that category of innovation. And unless you really feel like the only way you can be rewarded as an entrepreneur is by fundamentally reinventing an existing category or by making a vast amount of money very fast indeed and being willing to run the risk that you don't make anything, just be realistic about that. So of roughly 400 businesses that try to raise money from venture capital firms, something in the region of one to two will do so successfully at the Series A stage. Uh, of those one in 400, let's say one in 300 to be generous, about 4% of those companies that get Series A funding from a venture capital firm will go public. A further 8%, between 8 and 12, depending on which data set you use, will achieve an exit event which, which, uh, um, which rewards the founding team, members of the founding team, with a meaningful economic outcome, i.e. a few million apiece, right? So that's about, let's call it 10% of about one in 300. So just to calibrate how rare and difficult it is to go on that journey and how the odds are stacked against you. We often say, you know, the chances of building a successful business are low. It's not true. If you're setting up in business as a graphic designer and you're a good graphic designer, your chances of success are extremely high. If you're setting up in business as a plumber and you're a qualified plumber, your chances of success are very, very high indeed. The chances of success of running the gauntlet of building a company from first principles and then selling it and making a lot of money are quite low, even if you notionally know what you're doing. Uh, and of course, if you can raise money from other places, customers is the most obvious example of people who will give you money in return for your doing something useful for them. That's a heck of a lot less expensive. It also validates and reinforces the thing you're trying to do, which is build a product that changes people's lives or improves them for the better, or service. Uh, and it's unlike the money you raise from venture capitalists or the money you raise from banks, you don't directly or indirectly have to pay it back. All you have to do is deliver a great product and service, but then you're in business doing that anyway. But if you must, despite my, um, despite my entreaties, if you must pursue this fool, foolish um, on odds roulette game, then before you go on that journey, ask yourself really firmly and clearly, am I sure that I want this for me? It is a tough, hard slog. Um, one of the things that professional investors do when they put cash into your company is they set targets. And you'll agree them. At the beginning, they're not unpleasant targets. They're fun. They're a good challenge. You know, some writers have publishers or agents, and what those agents or publishers do is they help writers not miss deadlines. Right? And that can be good, that can be motivating, and that can be incentivizing. Until you miss targets. Because eventually, one way or another, every company has a tough period, a tough couple of months, tough couple of weeks, a tough couple of years. And when those targets get missed, you suddenly find that the people who are advocates and supporters are now critics. They're on your board and you can't get rid of them, particularly if they're professional investors. And you've got to keep them happy as well as your employees who really matter and who your pastoral responsibility is directed towards. Not to mention your customers, you've still got to keep them happy. If you're married or have a serious relationship, you've got to try not to make that person too unhappy. Your life's going to get pretty unpleasant on both ends. If you've got family commitments, you've got to keep your family happy. So by taking external capital in, you're dramatically increasing the probability that you're going to end up disappointing someone spectacularly. Now, it's one thing to take yourself on that foolhardy, difficult journey. It's another thing to take a bunch of other people with you. You know, so all success, to some extent, is the performance of success. There's always a sense in which um, success is the sort of the is the audacity to proclaim the inevitability of your own your own performance, and so the moment that you let people down, I don't know if you feel this, I do certainly. That neurotic voice in your head it's very punishing, and that can really drag you through a very unpleasant place. And one point, say we had some really tough times. Um, we had some very tough times. I remember, I think it was the Series B financing round. You know, I can probably share this now. Um, we were technically insolvent for a while. Um, you know, I think we delayed paying our hosts because of a technical problem. So the technical problem miraculously resolved itself the moment the cash hit our bank account. Thank goodness we were able to close that financing round. But that's a hair-raising experience. Now, the good news was we had that peculiar near-death experience when the company only had a few dozen people in it. By the time we sold the business, it had 700 people in it. Although, thankfully, that particular experience didn't repeat, 
when you've got 700 people looking to you and expecting you to make sure that they get paid on time, making sure that they can meet their mortgage uh, payments, that they can, they can delight their family and their children when they go home in the evening, that's a heck of a responsibility to bear. Are you sure you want to put yourself through that? There are other ways up the mountain. Now, where are we go here next? So, if you are going to do it, and you're sure you want this, <coughs> brace yourself. Um, every entrepreneur who raises money has a variant of the following story. I thought it was going to take three or four weeks. It ended up taking three or four months. Sometimes those stories, I thought it was going to take three or four weeks, it ended up taking over a year. Some of the most successful businesses on the planet took forever to raise cash. It took Nicholas and Yanis at Skype a long time, allegedly more than 40 meetings with investors, about a year, I recall, one of them once saying. You know, this was a tough business to raise money for. And this is notwithstanding the fact that you've got two unbelievably talented and battle-hardened entrepreneurs, both borderline genius on any measurable, on any measurable metric, both of whom have already demonstrated that they can blow up an industry. And remember Kazar? Right, and the damage that did to the music industry before people figured out how to sell streaming services. So it's not as if these guys were wet behind the ears. They were extremely sophisticated entrepreneurs with a very savvy and ingenious business, which if it was successful, was going to make people a lot of money. And it was really hard for them to raise money for it. Now, I can give you lots of other examples of this, but raising money is always hard. And it usually is the only thing that you as CEO of your company or boosted CEO of your company are going to be doing for that period. What I found particularly tough was because it's so existential, because when that check hits the bank account, everything changes. You can either go on running the business if you're, if you're running it at a loss, or what it enables you to do is so dramatically and transformationally different on this venture capital path, right? Not if you're raising money from a, from a small amount of debt or working capital loans or... Uh, uh, sort of an incremental capital sum, or if you're an established public company, in which case raising money is something you do on and off every day of the week. But as a small illiquid private company going through an institutional financing process, it's a step change function in what your business can achieve and how you can conceptualize it. Precisely because of that, when I was in the middle of fundraising processes, it didn't actually fill all my time. It's not like I was literally busy 14, 15, 16 hours a day just writing back you know, to and fro between venture capitalists or meeting people or having coffee catch-ups or doing slides. There's a chunk of that, and you have to be on it when the questions come in. If you're doing the job well, you will get questions. The problem is that when you're not doing something which is directly advancing the process of raising money, you feel like a right noodle. You can't do anything that has remotely that level of impact on your business. And I just found it was impossibly distracting. So all I can think about during that sort of, I in what is in any case, sort of monomaniacal pursuit, building a business from scratch, within that endemic monomania, you then have this sort of doubly unpleasant period in which you know you're, you're bearing the whole weight of the company on your shoulders and your shoulders alone. You can't really share, and some founders figure out how to, and if you, if you can figure this out, then tell me how you did it, because I think it's bloody hard to do. You can't really share with your team exactly the level of uncertainty and anxiety you fear, you face as a CEO, because A, it's not fair, and B, what do they do with that information? It's not fair to use your team as your therapy session. Your wife, husband, cat will probably by this stage long since have grown bored of your whinging about whatever it was that kept you awake last night. They just want to see more of you. My wife used to call it my screensaver mode because I was kind of there, but I wasn't. And actually what I wanted was sort of an endless well of, uh, of, of unquestioning, unconditional support, which by the way, no one apart from my mother has ever been willing to give to me, and rightly so. And the last thing she wanted to be was my sort of business therapist dealing with the thank, thank goodness I had a co-founder um, a guy called Demetrius who's brilliant, and at least the two of us could, could use each other as a sounding board and go through that hell together. But it is hellish, um, and you, it's very hard to build the business while you're doing that. And of course, raising money in one sense is building a business, but it's, raising, it's building a business only in the narrowest possible sense, that you're building a business that, that it enables you to do the stuff that actually creates value. The stuff that actually creates value is hiring great people. The stuff that actually creates value is doing, is doing and developing a great product. What creates value is finding new customers to buy your product and engage with those customers and make your product even better still and sustain whatever competitive advantage you have. Doing events like this, I think, George, is a great way to build the Tide brand. Um, shame you couldn't get a better speaker. But that notwithstanding, you know, this is exactly the kind of thing that creates buzz, it creates awareness, and it creates intention. 
Raising money doesn't. If you're lucky and you announce it, you might get some impact off the back of the announcement. If you're lucky and if you end up raising it from some big shot venture capitalist who everyone cares about. But again, most venture capital doesn't come with that level of marquee branding. And so most venture capital doesn't allow you then to cry from the rooftops about how successful you've been. So you're not building your business. It's massively distracting. You'll hate everybody by the time you've finally done it. And here's the worst bit. When you finally close the round, there's a pause. You might get drunk or you might go and just sleep. And then you wake up the next morning and realize, oh crap, I've just made an incredibly ambitious set of promises to demanding and unreasonably insistent people, and I'm now going to have to fulfill them. So as Demetrius, my co-founder, always used to say, you know, the, the prize for the winner of the sausage eating contest is more sausage. <laughs> Whether you're raising money from professional investors or you're raising money from your mum, um, whenever you are running a business of any description, you are selling. And if you're not the best salesman in your team, then find the best salesman in your team and make them the CEO. Because the most important job you've got to do when you're running your company is you've got to sustain that inevitable, that illusion of inevitability of success. That's a hard high wire to walk, but you've got to keep walking it. I call this the, this is the cognitive dissonance problem. The, 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 the term I use is the, the crushing it problem. Which is that when you're ever at a public event and someone says, hey George, how's it going? <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> now, sometimes that's true. Sometimes one is definitively crushing it. Sometimes you just had an unbelievably good day. You just closed that great client. You just closed that great hire. You just closed that great deal and got money into your company and you're off to the races. However, a good two-thirds of the time, something has been utterly shit about your day. Someone quit who shouldn't have quit. You didn't close that great client. Almost by definition, if you're the sort of ambitious person who's trying to change the world by building a business, you're constantly setting expectations of yourself and of your business that very slightly exceed your capability. It's interesting. That's actually how Harvard Business School, after doing an exhaustive bit of research to try to figure out what characterized entrepreneurship, ended up settling on a definition. Their definition was entrepreneurship is the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources presently under one's control which doesn't sound very different from how you characterize a megalomaniac dictator. But nevertheless, <laughs> the idea that somehow what entrepreneurial success means is I want to achieve something that I know I can't achieve yet based on the rational power I have. So I have to go and procure and tacitly figure out ways incrementally to augment my power so that I can accomplish this thing. So you're always setting expectations of yourself that slightly exceed your capability. That way success lies, but that way too madness lies, and certainly that way exhaustion lies. So they're out there every day in public, in front of your employees, in front of your investors if you have them, in front of your co-founders if you have them, in front of clients. Again, if you're running a business properly, you're always going to be spending time in front of your clients, directly or indirectly. And every single one of them looks deep into your eyes and says, how is it going? And you look deep into their eyes, and you have to say, with total conviction and absolute credibility, we're crushing it. Because if you're not able to do that, you won't. If you can't sustain the performance of success over the medium term, success will be elusive. Now, it's not enough just to sustain the performance of success. That's part of the equation, but it is an important part of the equation. And when you're tired behind the eyes, and when you know you can't switch that on, that's when you start losing the deals. So this is hard. And what makes it doubly hard is the cognitive dissonance it opens up when you know in your heart you have not had a good day and you're not crushing it and things are difficult. And what you want to do is you want to say, really shit day actually. <laughs> Just lost a really valuable client and I'm pissed off about it. And you know what, we could have prevented it, but so and so fucked it up. Firstly, they don't care unless they really love you. But even if, they, even if they do care, you probably can't be telling them that. You're going to have to find a spin on it, which means that the next customer is inevitably going to want to join your service. Now, there are certain contained kinds of failure that one is acceptably allowed to discuss. And I think well-functioning, high-performing teams do tend to discuss in an open and, and honest way the failures within the team context. But you as an entrepreneur still have to have that irreducible atomic faith in the inevitable success of your business. Because otherwise, A, why are you doing it? And otherwise, B, why the hell are they following you into battle or through the, you know, through the, uh, the, the long dark night? And I found particularly this was one of the hardest 
and most brutal and most bruising things. But the times when you most needed to sustain that illusion of inevitability of success, it was hardest to do and it really grinds away at you. It felt like, you know, the sort of the death of a salesman thing, of the salesman's out there on a smile and a shoe shine. Well, you are. You are on a smile and a shoe shine. At least until your business is big and the revenues are material and the big swanky office space is there and, you know, you're, you're, you're generating profit. At that point, you can have a bad day and you can tell the world, but you're still probably going to have a business the next morning. If you're only going to have a business the next morning, if you can close that next financing round, which we're talking about this, then that much more jeopardy exists, that much more stress is occasioned. And how are you going to vent that stress? I found it hard. Different people find different solutions. I've seen horrible, horrible movies. I don't mean literally. I mean, I've seen, the, I've seen stories unfold in a really awful way. I've seen entrepreneurs uh, lose control um, of their behavior. I've seen entrepreneurs become uh, addicted to uh, class A drugs. I've seen entrepreneurs have serious alcohol problems. Uh, and, and this stuff is not good. Yeah, I've seen, and we've all seen, often in public and often quite spectacularly, entrepreneurs screw up at least one marriage. Uh, this happens. It doesn't happen just because these people are workaholic. These people are workaholic because they've set expectations of themselves and the people around them that slightly exceed what is currently possible. And that constant ratcheting of pressure on oneself is demanding and can be debilitating. So, I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying this is hard. And the irony is that you've got to keep up that performance almost all the time. There might be very small numbers of close friends with whom you can drop your guard. But small numbers, close friends. Those people who aren't quite your friends are probably going to be the person who's going to introduce you to your next deal. They're going to be potential clients. They're going to be potential investors. They're going to be potential employees. And if they're not, why are you spending time with them? You're meant to be building a business, remember? So I think there's something here which is particularly brutalizing about the experience, the lone experience, the lonely experience of building a business under this kind of pressure. I don't think we're very good at talking about it, which is one of the reasons I like to talk about it. Um, finally, um, um, if you can create a safe space for yourself, sometimes fellow entrepreneurs are a good place, by the way. People who don't owe you anything and who you don't owe anything to. Because actually, by expressing your vulnerability and talking about it, and that's certainly where I found commonality. My co-founders at One Fine Stay, uh, a couple of friends of mine, other entrepreneurs, I did find there was room to talk about this stuff with those people. They got it instantly. <laughs> and those were the people you can actually talk honestly when they ask the question, so how are you doing? Um, when you go out and put sh you know, a shiny pitch deck together, um, it's a, great, it's a great misnomer. Venture capital is a, sort of, is a, it's a misleading term. The notion that people are investing in risk. Other things being equal, no one wants to buy risk. What somebody wants to buy is a certainty return. And if they think they're slightly smarter than the market, or they have proprietary knowledge, or insight, or access to deal flow, then they can buy that return less expensively, and they can get preferential outcome for their investors in turn. Venture capitalists hate risk. They hate risk as much as the rest of us. They just try to invest in categories where they can understand that risk slightly better than the next guy so they can get an unfair advantage and price appropriately. So what does that mean in practice? It means that when you go out and try to sell a dream to a venture capitalist, you're not actually selling an idea. No one ever gave anyone money for an idea. If you hear that story, what actually happened behind the scenes is someone incredibly impressive and persuasive and charismatic, probably with a heck of a track record, turned up not with an idea, but with a really thoughtful insight and a relevant team around them, and they impressed an investor so much that that investor was willing to back, at a very early stage, that business idea. Doesn't really the idea, it's not really the idea they're investing, of course, it's that founder <laughs> at that point in time pursuing that opportunity. Even then, very, very few of companies like that ever attract more than a few hundred thousand dollars or pounds of capital at that early stage. The only time you can really raise serious money for a business, and this is not always but almost always true, is when you have one of these. And from your side, it looks like that. It's a curve that goes up and to the right. And that curve is a proxy for something. It's a proxy for we can't manufacture enough of it fast enough. That's a way of understanding what Mark Andreessen calls product market fit. When asked to define it, a bit like the judge said of pornography, I know it when I see it. 
right? You know it when you see it. If you're in a business and you hit it, suddenly everything's on fire. Everything feels electric. You know people want your product. It's thrilling. And the moment you feel it slips away from you, panic rightfully because you've got to get that back. Until you've got that, your domin <laughs> the, dominant fun uh, the dominant strategy, or the objective function for an entrepreneur is to maximize your runway while achieving product market fit. The moment you've got it, it's an execution challenge to capture as much of the market you've unlocked as possible before the next guy does. But what venture capitalists particularly, less so seed stage investors, particularly venture capitalists are interested in is that. Because that's the point at which dollars in are likely, more likely than not, to be worth more than one dollar out. Now, clearly there's a pricing discussion. There's terms, there's control. We'll come back to that. But if you've proven enough to get that traction and that curve in the rearview mirror, not the forward-looking stuff, it turns out to be easier to build Excel models than a business. Who knew? So, of course, your five-year plan is going to do that. I'm not interested in that. Look back. What have you achieved? Are you actually manufacturing more stuff today and selling more today than you were last week, last month, last year, etc.? And is that accelerating pace of growth, in which case you've got traction? At that point, people will start returning your calls. Not only is it almost impossible to raise money until you have a product market fit story, it's almost impossible not to raise money if you do have a J-curve. Even pretty second-rate teams on the back of a gusher, <laughs> right, if they hit oil, will probably be able to raise money. Because some cynical guy will say, yep, I like this business. If I get in at the right price, I can always kick the CEO out. Now, you may or may not want to do that deal. You might still get rich by doing that deal, by the way. Of course, raises the question, what do you want? Do you want to be rich or do you want to be king? Because you probably can't have both of them. And the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Jeff Bezoses and the Bill Gates, don't be dazzled <laughs> by those stories. There's a reason we've heard of them. There are very, very few founding CEOs who do achieve venture capital funding who are still running their own businesses 10 years later. Doesn't, don't cry for them. Plenty of them have had a lot of happiness and, um, and, and achieved a lot in terms of material wealth, but very few of them are still king of the castle that they created because that's the deal you do with the devil. If you hear no, you know, it's the old thing. You, of course, you're going to have to run through walls. If you hear no more than a few times, the, the problem is, unfortunately, you often won't know why because no investor will ever tell you. If the reason you can't raise money is because somehow they don't buy you. They just don't quite see it. You don't quite have whatever that X factor is. You don't quite got muster that steely, determined, charismatic, uh, sort of visionary zeal that we all imagine, you know, in the sort of the Aaron Sorkin version of your movie of your life is going to be how you pitch your business. Now, you're never going to hear that. If you're really lucky, a friend might tell you. If you're really lucky, you're probably never going to know. It's just somehow things just don't happen. And that's really tough. Why is no one going to tell you? Because venture capital is a relationship industry. And the last thing I'm ever going to tell you is I'm not investing because I don't think you're backable. Because if the next thing you come back with is backable, you're never going to show it to me. So I'm always going to tell you a white lie. I'm always going to softball my criticism, which means you have to read between the lines. You may, if you're lucky, be able to get back channel feedback sometimes, sometimes, but only sometimes, asking a venture capitalist sincerely for candid feedback will get you closer to that. Best ask your friends, what's wrong with the way I'm telling this story? Am I coming across as credible? And if you don't have friends you can trust to do that, are you ready for this journey? I'm, I'm afraid to say, I'd be blunt about it, when I was at Index, I was always slightly astonished by some of the people who I bumped into who were trying to raise cash. The classic experience, um, and any, any VC will tell you this off the record, the classic experience after a conference or an event or something, is you sort of, you come down, you talk to someone, and there'll be a, because as soon as you say, I have money, you've got a line of people coming out, you know, out of the door, because everyone wants to be your friend if you've got money, right? Um, it's a bit like being the cute girl at the party. And so suddenly you've got this line of people who want to be your friend, and I this person has come up and they'd be in your face, and they'd have terrible breath, or like really bad BO. And it's not my job to tell them that, but all I'm thinking when they're talking is, I don't really want to be having this conversation. I'm going to end this as quickly as I can. 
Therefore, what am I going to do? I'm going to fob you off. And you're going to go away thinking, great, I got the guy's business card. Like, this, is, this, is, this one's going to go somewhere. It's not. And you're never going to hear why unless you have someone who's close enough to you and loves you <laughs> and who you trust and who trusts you. And so if you don't have that in your life, there's a problem. But there's a particular problem with your fundraising process. Now, unfortunately, it's not only the dumb first order stuff that people sometimes get wrong. It's often second and third order stuff. You're slightly more likely to hear the truth about why you're not raising money if the reason is less personally relevant to you and more about the market or something else. The, the best, smartest reasons that a venture capitalist will give you for not investing are ones that, um, that are things that they could change their mind about. Really good investors will be more honest than this. Less confident investors will not tell you that it's something fundamental. They'll say, sounds really interesting. Stay in touch. Yeah, we'd love to take another look, maybe in sort of three or six months. Hey, yeah, let's reconnect in, in a few weeks' time when you've achieved X, Y, or Z milestone. What are they doing? They're buying information, and it's pretty cheap for them to buy it. And of course, what you're doing in the meantime, if you're good, is you're going to make that forward-looking statement you're going to achieve that milestone. In fact, you're going to exceed it. And the next time we have a conversation, you're going to be 2x or 3x that number. And that's the first thing you're going to tell me. You say, hey, do you remember when we chatted last December, I told you I was going to sign up five clients. We signed up 15. OK, now you've got my attention. Because you've just set an expectation and exceeded it. And that's always the best way of getting credibility. Now. Um, I talked about friends and family quite a lot. Um, most of the money you raise before you go out and talk to professionally skeptical people will be from friends and family. <laughs> friends and family doesn't necessarily have literally to be your close friends and your family. Though those are good people to talk to if they have a little bit of cash. At one point today, we raised about 200 and something thousand from friends and family. Um, they were all people I knew personally, and my co-founder Demetrius knew personally. They did actually include my mum and my dad. Um, it included um, a couple of school friends. It included um, a father of a friend of mine who had a bit of money sloshing about. It included various other people. And I capped every single contribution at 20000 because I didn't want anyone to give me money that they couldn't afford to lose. And in many cases, people gave me much less. I didn't tell them very much about what we were doing. We made the decision that it wasn't really important at that stage. They were kind of backing us. Either we'd succeed or we wouldn't. If we didn't, then we come back and tell them within a year, sorry, didn't work, but thank you for trusting us, and hopefully we won't screw it up next time. Um, and if we did succeed, then it was all upside. So it's back to that joke I made at the start about setting expectations low and exceeding them. Uh, one of the best days of my life, and the best emails I ever got to send, I got to send last year when we announced the acquisition uh, in a largest transaction. It was, it was well north of 200 million. And sending that email... Um, you know, some of those people who backed us right at the very beginning, that was a great email. And it validated all of the trust and all of the patience they'd had uh, and all of their willingness to suspend disbelief as we went on this journey. The good news is some of them had almost forgotten exactly how much they'd invested. But they were delighted, obviously, when they made many, many times their money. Um, so it's really important. The other source of friends and family money... Your Mac will sleep soon, OK. Um, the other... Brilliant source of friends and family money is former employers. Um, not, it's not always the case that a former boss is going to have money coming out of their ears, but they know you, they've worked with you, and it's a natural segue into that kind of relationship. People you've worked with, colleagues, former employers, they kind of know you, they trust you, or they don't, but assuming they do, it's also a really good signaling effect. Because the people who are closest to you and have the best ability to judge your work are the ones saying, hell yeah, I'd follow him into battle. I think this guy's really good. I think she's amazing. I saw how good, how good a job she did when she launched our office. So I saw how good a job she did with that presentation. Or I saw how great he was in front of clients. Um, I've said this um, indirectly. Um, you are always selling. It can be the conversation in the corridor. It can be the elevator pitch. It can be any number of things that lead to the serendipitous meeting that ultimately results in that big win. Um, and I, I'm just, as I say this, I'm just like four or five examples immediately pop into my head. Um, one fine state particularly because our customers were homeowners, you know, they were affluent homeowners. So kind of everyone could be a customer of the service if they had a nice property, which means that if you're in certain kinds of parties or certain kinds of events, your entire room, your entire extended social network 
was a potential client of your business. That's clearly much less true if you're in an abstruse B2B business, but still the people you meet will often come to be useful to you and your business. And there's something very exciting about entrepreneurship to people who aren't part of that world, part of that demi-monde. When you talk to your friends in corporate jobs and the big law firms, the big accounting firms and you know, the large companies and the civil service, whatever it might be, they'll be fascinated. They won't get it. They will not begin to understand the hell you live through, the chaos, the mess, the uncertainty, the ambiguity, the constant torment of the soul. But they will be really interested. They'll find it exciting. They might pity you. They won't understand you. But they'll also be a little bit envious and excited by what you're going to do. And so those people can often become great advocates. Some of them can become members of your team. It's sometimes a journey. If someone's been too institutionalized, the journey into a startup is often a difficult and troublesome one. But some of those people can be your, 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 um, your early joiners. One of the best people we had involved with the business, a called Rishi, didn't end up joining us in full time until much later. He did later, actually. He joined us full time about two or three years later. Um, he helped us out with our brand work. Right at the start, he was a friend of a friend. I was literally chatting to him in a pub at a friend's thing. And turns out he was a, he was a professional copywriter. He was a very insightful guy. Um, I said, hey, I'd, I'd love to get your help with this. And he said, oh, okay, it sounds fun. He gave us about three days of his time. He didn't even bother invoicing me. It was transformational. He got us, he helped us figure out our first brand identity. He loved it. It was fun and interesting for him. He was having direct impact on a business, usually his large clients at the advertising firm where he worked. You know, everything got multiply edited before it finally got out to, out to the client. Well, here he's having direct impact on the development of a business. It's fun and exciting. He gets something out of it. We got a lot out of it. And that was one of those chance meetings. So I think there's nothing, um, especially if you're part of any kind of, you know, London entrepreneurial or ecosystem, sell to everybody all the time. And, um, and never let your guard down. That one speaks for itself. If anyone asks you to do it, don't. I think we're getting smarter about that stuff now. Occasionally I hear horror stories. I heard one recently, actually. But never, ever, ever, ever make a personal guarantee on a loan. There are companies um, who specialize in helping you sell your business to people. Um, we, 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 we like to be rude about bankers at Tide, so um, here's, you know, we're, we're saying um, uh, we can't let bankers and admin get in the way of what we do best. We're not talking about retail banks, though. we're talking about investment bankers, and investment banks can and do play a valuable intermediary role. They help buy and sell complex assets, and when, inevitably, when, not if, your business is hugely successful, and you need to sell a complex part of it, complicated shareholder structures, or the whole business perhaps, or maybe you're buying someone else's complicated asset. It's very valuable to have sophisticated professionals who know how to value and sell complex assets. Some of them are also good fun at parties. The problem is that until there is a complexity in your asset that justifies the involvement of a banker, by putting somebody between you and the person you're trying to raise money from, Ironically, you're actually sending precisely the wrong signal. You're telling your investors, I'm not capable of raising money for my own business. You're also, ref you're also hiding from your investors the most valuable information, which is how credible you are as a founder and a CEO. And actually, you getting in front of a venture capitalist and showing them just how impressive you are, how persuasive you can be, Bear in mind, part of the question they're asking themselves is not just do I want to give you my money, but do I believe that once I've given you my money, you're going to deploy it well? That you're going to be able to persuade unbelievably talented people to join you on your crazy journey to change the world. That you're going to be able to persuade other people to give you money. You're going to persuade clients to trust you with whatever it is that you're asking them to trust you with and give you their money, which is much more valuable than the investor's money. So, the most valuable single bit of information that a venture capitalist can gather about the business they're evaluating until it's a much bigger enterprise and lots of people and structure and systems and process. 500 people in a business, fine. At that point, founding CEOs begin to become somewhat dispensable. Even so, 
500, 5,000 person companies, the ones led by founding CEOs often retain an agility and an ability to adapt in response to competitive pressure that, that professionally managed businesses don't. So the last thing you want to do is hide the most important asset your company has, you, away from people who want to evaluate you and secondarily, the business that you are building. Um, it is hard, it's unpleasant, it's distracting, it will make you miserable, and it will help to ruin your life and your marriage. But unfortunately, it's the only way. And so, never ever give up. It's hard, it's lonely, it's difficult. But never doubt that a small number of people in a room can change the world. It's the only way it's ever happened. So you have to have this irrational conviction, this faith, this determination, this unyielding um, self-belief, which if you're sane, is inevitably colored during the long, dark nights and in the quiet moments by pangs of anxiety and self-doubt. And you have to live through those moments of self-doubt. And you've got to go out and you've got to be willing again and again to put yourself on the line much like people say to young aspiring actors, you know, every audition is the most important audition of your life because people can smell desperation. <laughs> they can smell lack of self-belief and conviction, unfortunately. We as humans are incredibly good at it. We're like, we're like um, we're sort of guided missiles at inauthenticity. We, we smell inauthenticity in people. And so to persuade someone authentically, particularly if it isn't authentic, is a high order performance skill. And if you got it, that's half of what it takes to be a salesman. The other way, by the way, of being a good salesman is to have an astonishingly high level of credulity. Um, if you can persuade yourself the thing you're selling is actually the best thing since sliced bread, you won't have to lie. Uh, unfortunately, if you have that level of credulity, you probably aren't going to make a particularly analytically rigorous entrepreneur. But nevertheless, some companies succeed on that basis. And ultimately, if you keep getting no, if you keep getting the door shut in your face, eventually, Yep, there is a time when it's right to give up. James Dyson, I think this one's, a, uh, I think this one was James Dyson, um, ended up remortgaging his house several times. He borrowed a lot of money from his family. Ended up basically falling out with half the Dyson clan um, because they called the loans that they made him. I think it took him something like 18 years to go from product idea uh, to the first Dyson vacuum cleaner as we know it and love it. Um, I mean. It's unheard of to spend that long pursuing what kind of was a little bit like a crazy idea someone dreamt up in a shed. Now, James Dyson is not a crazy man in a shed, but would he have been materially distinguishable from a crazy man in a shed for many of those 18 years? Possibly not. I don't know about you, but I don't fancy spending 18 years of my life pursuing that crazy dream in the hope that one day I can change the world. Um, because the chances are, by the end of that, that I'm not going to be the one who changes the world. On the other hand, it were for him. So what do I know? He's much more successful than I am. On the other hand, I just don't think I would take that journey, and I wouldn't take that much risk with my life and my career. So you have to make your own bed. You have to decide how much, how much of a debt to allow yourself to run up, a debt of your, from your, not just paid, of course, in cash but also your health, your friends, your family, your social life, your marriage, all those things that are likely going to suffer while you're on your crazy, determined vision. And that <coughs> is my top 10 tips. And I'm happy to do Q&A or anything else. Thanks so much for the testimony. It's really, really, felt really real and genuine. So it's really good. One thing that I was wondering about is you describe all the pains that you yeah. went through as, as you were building your business, yeah. but I wonder how it was like after you sold it, and what's next for you, and whether it's addictive, basically, if all that pain is addictive. I think the pain, I mean, unless you're mad, I don't think the pain is addictive. Um, I mean, look, I don't dwell on the sort of the exultant moments, because there's a hundred books um, that'll do that for you, and it's easy to speculate how great it feels, you know, to have a big win, or to, whether that's a small intermediate win or an eventual outcome where you sell a business and make money, right? All that's good. Um, I think the most emotionally resonant um, successes aren't necessarily even the sort of venal, um, selfish ones. They're the sense of satisfaction that you get building a team. Um, I hugely enjoyed and found very rewarding experience of coaching people and mentoring people. 
um, seeing someone come in, you know, in their first career or first job and seeing them go through and making all these dumb mistakes, but then so quickly learning from them, adapting and becoming more seasoned professionals. And then seeing so many of those people now often running their own companies. And that's fantastic. It's unbelievably rewarding. Um, you know, one finds they has spawned, I don't know, a dozen other startups now from its early team and people who grew and were shaped by that experience. And I think that's just enormously, an enormously rewarding thing which will, lo which will long outlast whatever particular services and products we manufactured as a company. Um, so it's not that there isn't huge amounts of satisfaction and pleasure and fulfillment. And don't get me wrong, I would do it again. And I'd do it again even if the movie didn't end well. It would be a hell of a lot easier if you knew the movie was going to end well, of course. But I'd do it again. And I said to myself, and I rationalized the decision to take a jump out of what was a very gilded cage. You know, working in venture capital is like being locked in a five-star hotel, I said to someone once. Um, it's a very comfortable life. But as the balloon rises, you, know, you have to decide, am I going to hold on to this string, or am I going to go and take a risk and do the thing myself? And if I'd done that and it had gone spectacularly wrong, 12, 24 months of that, I'd have learned a ton. I'd have been humbled by it, and that's always a good thing. Um, I think a bit of failure goes a long way. Uh, too much failure can damage, you know, uh, and 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 make people very brittle. But I, it's not that I discourage anyone from doing it. I just think we don't talk very much, or not enough, about the cost, the consequence, and the suffering, which is real if you're going through this. And unfortunately, um, it, because it doesn't sell books, right? Um, so I just feel that's a sort of, it's a bit of a sort of moral crusade I'm on. Over the last kind of three or four years, crowdfunding through Kickstarter and Indiegogo has become really popular for bringing consumer products to market. Just kind of wondering whether you had a, a, um, any kind of opinion on whether that kind of concept can kind of move more into kind of where venture capital traditionally kind of edits kind of through really. We'll never say never. It could happen. Um, it's typically a less expensive form of cash, i.e. You, you have you know, less dilutive and less selective pressure than most venture capital funds. <coughs> I, I, I'm a little bit skeptical that crowdfunding is going to replace the, main, uh, the mainstream um, tier one, tier two venture funds for businesses that require significant sustained capital investment. You know, businesses like um, Uber and so on, it's very hard to see how on earth you could have built a company like that just with crowdfunding. It's always, always going to involve, and building a global brand is always going to involve enormous deployment of capital. So uh, I, I, I don't think venture capitalists are uh, sort of in any great jeopardy, and you know, n not by the way that I would deeply grieve if they were, but I, I feel like um, there are certain categories of products and service for which crowdfunding can make sense because you have a natural, oops, a natural um, uh, elision uh, or coincidence between your customer group and your investor group. Having said that, um, I think quite a lot of crowdfunded businesses aren't very good businesses. And it remains to be seen how many of them will then make the cart after the second and third wave. Um, I think a lot of people will lose money by investing in crowdfunded companies. And that's fine, you know, it's an investment activity, right? It's necessarily speculative. Um, will that temper the markets, the retail markets enthusiasm? Maybe. Um, and I'd, I'd, by the way, I'm not. It's not because I have I sort of exalt venture capitalists as some sort of guru. I don't. I mean, there there are there are there are great business people who invest in other people's money, and there are terrible, um, you know, mercenary egomaniacs who do that job. Um, and that's why, if you ever actually get a term sheet from anyone, you might be tempted to sign. Do your damnedest to <laughs> get references on them, and don't take no for an answer. I mean, really get references. This is a much more permanent relationship than anyone you will hire. I mean, you take references on anybody you bring into your team, but you cannot reverse the investment decision that you make. They have got a piece of your company. They will have the right to attend your board, probably, or similar. Um, and they have the ability to make your life absolutely awful uh, if they behave badly on boards, etc. So anyway, that's an aside. Um, so no, I think it's an interesting phenomenon, and I know some people who've raised good cash through that route. Um, I think it's probably more applicable for some models than others. Lastly, if you, were you passionate about one fine, uh, one fine thing when you first fundraised for it? And if so, would, why would you give up on it? I mean, I understand that right now you've transitioned to other companies. So. 
Well, so two things to say. I, 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 I certainly was, and I still am. It's an amazing business, and I think it's an incredible service, and I think it meets needs on both sides. I think it corrects a profound market failure. I think it makes more of properties that otherwise sit unused. I think it's an incredible way to experience a city. I, I no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still a big believer in the business uh, and in the product. So, so it's not that's, I, I, didn't, I didn't fall out of love with the company or the concept. Um, I, think, I think maybe something I didn't tease out, so thanks for the question. Is is that the, the the Mephistophelian pact when you take external capital from an institutional investor is they have to get their cash out one day. And I said at the beginning, a tiny proportion of businesses will go public. A tiny proportion. Um, one finds they might have pursued that route. In fact, we seriously considered pursuing that route at a certain point. Um, most businesses will have some sort of trade sale. They'll be bought by another company in their broadly construed sector. If you're lucky, they'll be bought for many times revenues or many, many times profits, and everyone will make a lot of money. If you're less lucky, they'll be bought for slightly more or even slightly less than the capital you put into the business, and founders will make pretty much nothing. Um, so it goes. Uh, but it does mean that the moment you take that check from a professional investor, you're committed on a path. And that path is likely, not necessarily, but very likely to result in you're having to sell the business one day, and you're having to let go of it. That's, that's how they get their money out. No venture capitalist is ever going to give you cash if they don't have a pretty high confidence that if you're successful, you're going to sell the business and they're going to make a super normal return, which helps compensate them and their investors for all the companies they invest in that don't return capital. So you've sort of got to go down that path with your eyes open. If what you want to do is build a beautiful business which you run forever and a day, if you want to build a business which you hand over to your children one day, if you want to build a business because you enjoy the work that that business requires that you do, if you're, uh, if you're a graphic designer because you love graphic design, if you're a dentist because you want to be a dentist and you're good at being a dentist, well, it has the highest suicide rate of any profession I read recently, dentistry. Oh, oh, and, and, and vets. Number two is vets. Presumably because people go into veterinary science because they don't they were like little fluffy things. They end up spending their whole time killing horses. Um, so uh, if you want to do something as a consumption good, and the business is a way to enable you to do that, then you'd be mad to raise external capital. Because again, you're not going to be able to give those people an economic return. Certain kinds of businesses can dividend out to investors. It's remarkably rare that a venture capital finance business will return adequately to their investors through dividends. It's not, it's not unknown, but it's very rare. I say very few of them will go public because public, taking a business public is a difficult, perilous, and very long and painful journey. And by the way, it often, for a founding CEO, doesn't mean you can get out. Um, most companies, when they go public, it's almost a prerequisite that the CEO is going to have to remain in place for a, a long time as a head of a public company. And as George has rightly identified with all of the, <laughs> the marketing language on the walls, one thing that most entrepreneurs absolutely hate is administration and bureaucracy. Well, welcome to hell. I haven't run a public company. I know people who do, and it's miserable. Um, you know, the kind of the earnings treadmill and all that sort of stuff. And again, don't be fooled by Jeff Bezos. Very few <laughs> public company CEOs have his clout or his track record. Ask Tim Steiner, who've done well, by the way, but it's been a long, hard slog, right, building that business. Or Alex Zoopla. Again, that's a long, hard journey. So when, <coughs> when you actually were, were acquired, was it, in a sense, part of your exit strategy when you first gained the finance? Or did they then basically twist your arm and say, well, this is where we, we're going, regardless of what your plans were? It's very hard to make an entrepreneur sell a business if, if the entrepreneur doesn't want to. Um, in theory, lots of term sheets have clauses about, you know, if you haven't procured a sale within next years, then, you know, investors have the right to demand that the same is accomplished. Remarkably hard to sell a business that someone's actually running. Um, because if you want to scupper a deal as a founder, you can always find a way to scupper the deal. Just be a bit of a dick, right? Or not turn up on time for a meeting or be too slow to respond to requests, etc. So in practice, it kind of always has to be, or almost always has to be, the CEO's decision and passionate determination uh, at the point the deal's presented to that person. 